I'm Kwanguliwe, and welcome to this edition of Africa 360. It's Women's Month here in South Africa, and the 9th of August is National Women's Day, commemorating the political sacrifices of the Liberation Movement's women. In 1956, nearly 20,000 women gathered outside the Union buildings in Pretoria. Standing against South Africa's segregationist past laws, the women left stacks of signed petitions and held a silent protest for a full 30 minutes. Across the continent, African women have always played a powerful political role, often though as wives or mothers of great leaders. But as more and more women become leaders in their own right, the challenges, unfortunately, still outnumber the successes. Who is the contemporary African woman? Wife? Mother? Leader? Entrepreneur? A myriad of labels have been pinned on women. But do African women define their own identities? Historically, feminism has been the most effective ideology to communicate gender inequality. But gender issues vary as much as society does. While some societies may debate extended maternity leave, others are fighting for access to basic education. One media analyst, Nobisa Sigaba, advises clients on how to best identify their brand in the public space. A Muslim woman with roots in rural Eastern Cape, Sigaba has carved her own identity. I do sometimes consider myself a feminist. Uh, one thing that I have come to notice about feminism theory is that it's a very value-free uh, sort of way of thinking. Um, and by value-free, I mean that there's not necessarily a standard by which women sort of confine themselves in, in, in creating an identity of who they are. Many cultures have a very specific definition for the role of women in society, a role that some may call subservient. My belief system actually drives the sort of feminism ideas that I have. And in respect of your elderly and obviously your husband as well, it doesn't mean you're subordinate to those people. It just means you actually have a proper relationship in which you create an environment where you're able to express your views in such a way that you're clear. An expectant mother of a daughter in a few weeks, Sigaba aims to teach her daughter and her son that their identities are forged from a sense of dignity and a strong religious grounding. In the quest for gender equality, it's time for African women to forge their own identities. So what's the role of the contemporary woman in Africa? Director for Policy and Research at Sonke Gender Justice Network, Sisonke Msamang joins me in the studio. Sisonke, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Now, when we talk about um, women issues, I mean, they can range from literacy to gender violence and all sorts. What exactly are women's issues on the continent? So I tend not to talk about women's issues. I tend to talk about gender because I think when we talk about it as women's issues, it makes it seem as if half of the people are responsible for those issues, as though somehow those issues are the problem of half the people, right? So when you talk about gender, then you talk about how, as a society, we need to change so that women and men are respected. And that means getting men to play their parts. So women's issues, as it were, um, are about those, th those areas of life where women cannot participate fully to the same degree as men do. And so, as you say, that ranges from uh, issues of education to agriculture to uh, leadership. So it's a whole range of issues. But what we need to begin to talk about is the underlying issues. Because if we only talk about the women or only talk about the men, then we continue to individualize problems. So maybe Kenya can deal with their problem, or maybe Egypt can deal with their problem. But if we talk about the underlying structure, which is gender, then we, we start to move forward. Now, it's interesting that you said um, you don't talk about women's issues. You talk about gender issues. Now, recently, we've seen a lot of people talking about feminism. It looks like it's making a comeback. What's your comment on that? So I think the debate about feminism tends to be one that um, distracts us from the real issues. So. Because the word sounds so aggressive, because the word connotes you know, people in the streets burning their <coughs> bras, um, it connotes some sort of, in many people's minds, um, feminists hate men. That's what people understand by feminism. 
obviously that's not what feminism is and in many ways the conversation you and I are having right now wouldn't be possible had it not been for feminist academics, philosophers, thinkers. Um, you know, there's a, a, a wonderful quote that says, um, a feminist is any woman who doesn't believe that they should be walked over like a doormat, right? So I think that this debate about feminism tends to be distracting. The real question should be about what are we doing to address the underlying gender issues that make it um, possible for men to live more productive lives than women still today in 2014. And are we exploring those issues currently? I think we are. I think there's, you know, one of the, the most interesting developments on the continent in the last five years has been social media. A lot of people say social media is for the elite, you know, only rich people use it, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I, I'm a bit more optimistic than that. And so if you look at the the usage of social media, if you look at the ways in which it's possible for a young generation of women to express themselves mm -hmm. far more openly and honestly without fear of their voices being diminished because there's an anonymity that comes with uh, you know, doing things online, I think there's some real potential. So I think we aren't doing enough, but there's certainly lots more that's being done. And Africa is a very interesting space when it comes to women's rights and when it comes to gender issues. After the break, we move to the proverbial boardroom and look at the strides women have made in business. I think a strong, stronger women equals a stronger nation. Welcome back to Africa 360, I'm Kwangu Liwewe. In today's show, we're looking at the role of African women in the 21st century. One of the most prominent places that women have made their mark is in business. Women have entered the workplace and a handful have climbed to the top, paving the way for the next generation. Some have turned male-dominated industries into a place where women can thrive. Africa 360 producer Lindsay Chutel finds out more. Is it really still a man's world? Women have entered every sector and industry, but those very women have also learned that pushing through the glass ceiling is no longer enough. The best way to break into business is still to jump right in. And that's what Ngobele Ndimande did when she decided to strike out on her own. After years of being a personal assistant to high-flying executives, Demande decided that it was time to start her own business. Trying her hand first at running a placement agency, she then became a florist, but quickly moved from pruning petals to setting up scaffolding. I then registered um, Dileka Luzuko Construction. It's my daughter and my son's name. So Dileka means dignity, Luzugo means glory, and I said I will run the construction with dignity and pride. I've been a single parent with three children, and I've managed that so I can do it. I think construction is the only sector that has blended well with my personality and character because it needs resistance, it needs strength, it needs perseverance, and it needs a reader, a person that continuously challenge the policies. Demande is also a proud member of the South African Women in Construction, an organization aimed at cementing the presence of women in the sector. Demande has been vocal about inequality in the industry, especially after the revelation that a handful of big companies had colluded to control infrastructure development around the FIFA World Cup hosted in South Africa in 2010. The tender boards uh, is 90% boys club and the collusion is 100% wise. Demanda is now determined to become the first female run fiber optics company in a growing telecoms industry. Still learning, she's identified mentors in the sector and is on site every day without pay. Through the research I've done is that there are no women, 100% women owned companies that are in the space of fiber optic. So it will be, it's going to be a very interesting process. A process that will certainly break down barriers and open the door for more women in male dominated industries like construction. Is the workplace the final frontier or is it paving the way for greater inclusion? With me in the studio is Director for Policy and Research at Sonke Gender Justice Network, Sisonke Msimang, 
Also joining us is the editor of the Continental Women Business Magazine, Forbes Woman Africa, Renuka Mithal. Thank you, ladies, for joining us once again. Cool. Now, Renuka, I'll start with you. Um, six of Africa's six of the world's rather fastest economies are in Africa and obviously everyone's talking about Africa rising but African women rising with Africa. Absolutely I think that's a statement that I'll always agree with. The examples you have are of women who who've defied the odds they're in male-dominated uh, in industries and they're calling the shots I mean and we have these Forbes lists, as you know. We always come up with these lists. There's so many of the so many women in those on those lists now, and more women from Africa. So that's that's been fantastic. So Zonka, maybe you can come in there. But yes, uh, she has spoken about women rising, but yet at the grassroots, even middle class women, we see they don't have access to land, they don't have access to loans. There's a lot of domestic violence on the continent. These issues are still quite pertinent, aren't they? I think they are, and I think what's um, important is to recognize that the Africa Rising story um, is a very real story. It's a very inspirational story. It's also a story that can sometimes um, not give us the full picture about what continues to exist in our societies and in our communities. But in some ways, the most interesting thing about the Africa Rising story is the extent to which so much of it has been propelled by really interesting business women. So the, the, a person who I have a huge amount of respect for is a young woman in Nigeria who's a helicopter pilot. She's also a doctor. And she decided that she was going to combine her two passions and strengths. And so she runs an air ambulance service um, that flies all over West Africa. Now, that would have been unimaginable 10 years ago. So I think it's both the fact that there, are, there remain deep inequalities and big problems at the grassroots, but that in some ways the ways in which women are leading inspires those who are you know, still to follow. Now, a book which is much talked about, especially um, in the gender circles, is Facebook CEO's book, um, Cheryl Sandberg's Lean In. And of course, she's talking about bringing women more into the boardroom and onto the table. Now, when we look at African women, how possible is this and what can we do to ensure that this happens? I think it's eminently possible. Sometimes I feel, you know, women are their own enemies. I think the moment you start seeing yourself as a woman, there is a stereotype that you're building up. We need to see ourselves as human beings. And I think that's when you rise. We need to start recognizing our own voice in the boardroom, start recognizing that we have the power, and we have to start recognizing our abilities and our talent and talk about it. Sisanka, your thoughts on that? If, if, if what it takes to survive in a corporate context is to be ambitious and driven and, and, and not to stop pushing for men, then surely that's what we need for women to do. So that's Sandberg's argument. And this other article actually said that women are increasingly having to make a choice, especially women at the very top, are increasingly having to make a choice between their families and their, career, and their careers. And in some ways, I think the truth of leaning in or leaning back yes. is, is somewhere in the middle. For me, as a woman who has children and an active career and I'm very invested in advancement, um, leaning into the current workplace is not going to work. So I think it, we need to be having a conversation about how you, how African women are able to lean in, but how African women are also able to change the work culture and the work environment so that it works for them and it works for us. Then how can African women bring a different perspective to the workplace? I think uh, by being more visible, and we need more positive reinforcements, uh, and that you need to start talking. Again, start engaging in a dialogue, you know, whether it's through a networking forum or whether it's through various business organizations, just, just start talking and just start a conversation. It's very, very important to learn from each other's success stories, to be inspired and not be afraid to take that first step. And I, that's the only way you can do it. Renuka, your magazine has profiled very prominent African women. Just tell us what characteristics um, did they share with you that um, took them to the top? I've had the opportunity to travel across Africa. So from Rwanda to Kenya to Durban to, uh, to here in South Africa. I mean, it's been a wonderful journey. I'll give you some examples. I know we know Rwanda has the highest representation of women in parliament. Just the stories. I mean, that representation in parliament is very much a mirror of the society as well. The, the women I met there have come up They've had the genocide in their past, and it's been in, it's still so very fresh in, in their memories. But 
what are they doing to the country now? I mean, I think a strong, stronger women equals a stronger nation. And that Rwanda is a perfect example of that. I'm yet to see that in South Africa. I'm still very new, as I said. But I, I think that's a perfect example for the rest of Africa, even, even for the rest of the world, really. Sisonka, she's told us, she's given Rwanda as an example of progressive country when it comes to gender issues. Which ones would you say are lagging behind? In gender terms, I think that some of our small countries are not doing well. So Swaziland is not doing particularly well, exacerbated by HIV. Um, on education, we continue to see Southern African countries in particular not doing great when it comes to increasing the numbers of girls uh, getting out of the factory of, 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 of primary school. Uh, so SADC is not doing so great in, in, in a number of the indicators. Are women doing enough to make their mark? Join us after the break as we continue the conversation on Africa's women today. How is it possible that we've allowed men to be presidents for so long when we know who's so much better at handling these issues? Mother of the nation. sister of the revolution. Women have certainly played a prominent role in Africa's liberation struggles. But standing side by side on the front lines hasn't guaranteed equality. About eight African countries have parliaments with more than a third of the seats occupied by women. Rwanda leads the pack with about 63% in the lower house and about 38 in the Senate. At the opposite end of the spectrum, Botswana, Mali, Cote d'Ivoire, Gambia, Congo and Nigeria. They have the worst female representation, less than 10%. Ellen Johnson, Sally. But does having a woman at the helm make a difference? Africa has only three women presidents. All three were appointed amidst crisis. One was just voted out, Joyce Banda of Malawi. Across the continent, traditional gender roles still shape society. It seems political liberation hasn't always brought social freedom for women. And it's clearly time for women to simply take that freedom for themselves. Can women have it all? Today on Africa 360, we're discussing the role of women in the 21st century Africa. Our conversation continues with editor of Forbes Woman Africa, Renuka Mithil, and director for policy and research at Sonke Gender Justice Network, Sisonke Msumang. Welcome back, ladies. Now let's talk about the political front and women. A lot of talk about 50% uh, representation. How feasible is it, Sisonke? I think that it has to be feasible because it's important. We live in a society where there's only basically two, two sexes, so <laughs> it's important that we try and get there. How realistic is it? I think it's, um, I think unfortunately this is the last big barrier. Uh, and this is, I think we recognize this globally, that uh, you know, gender inequality is not an African problem. It's exacerbated because we are a poorer continent than others, even as we are on the rise. But I think the last big barrier for all societies is to recognize that women, we must reach 50-50 in all spheres. Now, when we look at, um, on the political front, of course, especially the ruling parties and the other parties have um, what we call a women's league. And often these leagues are supposed to be lobbying for women's rights. But in Africa, we haven't been seeing this much. Um, would you say that women's leagues have now become obsolete? I think that women's leagues um, played an important role in, particularly in the Southern African context, in the liberation struggle. That's where you see them being the strongest. I think that what has happened, and this is not, I think this is, re this is reality. Mm. Women's leagues are important, but I don't think that they're as important as they used to be because there's so many different voices, the media, so many spaces where women's voices can be heard. Now maybe you can give us a perspective because we know you have worked in India, you've been in Singapore, in the Middle East. Yes. How are these um, organizations <coughs> such as Women's League, if they do exist, how powerful are they? I have never, ever seen this kind of women's participation and movement as I have seen here in Africa. The 1956 August 9th uh, uprising is a perfect example. I think it's relevant, it's timeless, and it's not dated. That was a perfect example of all color, women of all colors, races, you know, going up there and making a statement 
and they made it work. That is what we need to see happen even today in this context. Now when we look at Central African Republic and we look at um, Liberia and we know what those two countries have been through and what they're going through with a woman head of state, um, are women strong enough to handle these issues, especially when it comes to issues like civil war? Well, I mean, it's a great question because we know in some ways it's an ironic question, right? We know that women are strong enough because we know that women bear the brunt of war. We know that women bear the brunt of disease. Uh, so in some ways, the, the real question for me is always, how is it possible that we've allowed men to be presidents for so long when we know <laughs> who's so much better at handling these issues? Um, I, also, I mean, I think that there's, all, there's always these big debates in, in when you talk about women in politics. And the debate is, is there something inherent in women that is going to make us better or worse leaders? Is it? I think not. I think that there. I think that all people are a, um, a are they arise because of their circumstance. Right. So I think because of the cultures and societies in which women have to endure a lot, um, what you find is that women tend to focus on communication far more than men. They tend to be more inclusive in their style of leadership, and that is often a reason why women don't rise to the top. Now, let's still use the example of Joyce Banda, who lost yes. the election in May. Yes. Some critics say, yes, she did fail to break into the boys' club. How do women leaders um, just avoid these obstacles? How do they deal with these obstacles, so to say? I think, uh, as I said, uh, communication is a very, very important part of that, persuasive communication. Uh, they need to start talking to the men. I mean, I think one of the fundamental problems we have is that in our schools, the girls are taught a certain way and the boys are taught a certain way. I think they should both be taught about stereotypes, boys particularly. They need to be involved in that education. That these are not stereotypes you grow up, uh, you know, endorsing. So that, it, it should, that is how the change should start in the grassroots level. But then when in a country like South Africa, we continuously hear that South Africa is not ready for a female president, what message is this sending to the youth? I think one Especially of the, the young aspiring girls. I'll go back to the point that I made earlier. I think one of the most exciting things about being, particularly in, in, the, in the current state of the South African democracy, is that people don't allow those kinds of statements to go unchallenged anymore. So we did have a, a, a situation in which the, the, the Women's League said um, that, and I think the statement was, and I think it's actually a true statement, that the ANC is not ready for a woman president. And the country may be ready for a woman president, but the ANC, that, that political party and the structures and the way in which it increasingly operates, doesn't feel that, it, that it's ready for a political party and that's it's, uh, is, is not ready for a female president, and that's its own prerogative. But what was fantastic was the conversation that opened up, that people in society called in to radio shows, men and women saying, what does this mean about my child? Uh, you know, it was a wonderful conversation, and I think that's the importance of, 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 these, of these, these discussions open out, and that's how change happens. Renuka, you've spoken extensively about how women need to communicate more. Where are we lacking here? What's the problem? Don't we have the confidence? What, what seems to be the problem? It's the confidence, yeah. I think all of us lack confidence, even in a boardroom, if you see. Uh, I know some of the boardrooms that I've been in. Uh, I also tend to be quiet. I mean, I always ask myself, uh, why? I mean, I have to, even if I'm wrong, I have to be able to say it. It's important to say it and put it out there. When I was a CEO, I mean, part of how you change that is by role modeling things differently, but also by challenging, uh, you know, what, what we now call everyday sexism. So, for example, and Sheryl Sandberg talks about this a lot in Lean In, actually. So for example, if we're in a staff meeting um, and after three or four inputs have been made and I notice that no woman has spoken yet, I'll deliberately call on a woman. And I'll not just deliberately call on a woman uh, because I say, oh, you know, Alice, you look as if you want something to say. I'll say, everyone who's spoken so far has been a man. <laughs> so it, it brings it in the room, yeah? It's not to embarrass people. And the more you do that, the more you push. So it, I think it both is sometimes a confidence issue, but sometimes we become so accustomed to accepting gender roles that we don't question them. So it's not just about the confidence side. It's also about getting men to understand how what they do makes girls feel like they should be quiet. Renuka, That's maybe true. there you can come in and tell us how men can play their role in empowering women. A lot of men who are backing their women, it's no longer, uh, you know, that uh, sh she is the reason for his success. I think it's the other way around as well. 
and uh, again, they, there should be more involvement. They should also be, it, it should be inclusive discussions. Even when you have these networking forums, I think it's always better, best to get in a man or get in a group of men and hear what they have to say about uh, women's emancipation. I think that would be, we often don't include men in the discussion and I think we should start doing that. Renuka, you've talked about the importance of men playing a role in empowering women, yet your magazine, I haven't seen any men featuring there. Just to inspire women that, you know, well, these positions uh, exist. Well, it's Forbes Woman. The magazine's called Forbes Woman, but I would definitely love to have a man on the cover someday. <laughs> I think women need to know about men, and uh, it's, it's vice versa. I think the interest is vice versa. So give me an opportunity, and I'll definitely have a man on the but cover. But he has to earn it. He has to earn <laughs> he has it. To earn and it. he has to be nice to women, yes. The first man on the, on the Forbes woman, I, 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 I want to be part of the selection panel that chooses him. I'll He's definitely keep you it. in mind. I mean, well, ladies, on that note, thanks very much yes. for joining us on Africa sure. 360. Well, is this the age of women? And are African women leaning in? Tell us what you think via our Facebook page or tweet us at Africa360 underscore ENCA. You can also send us an email at africa360 at enca.com. If you would like to watch this or previous episodes, go online to www.enca.com forward slash africa360. And on that note, that's the end of this week's show. Do take care.